after about 365 days of turmoil and angst, a chance of redemption finally availed itself. One can only imagine the amount of stress and anxiety, the nightmares, the disappointment that came with being a member of the Virginia Cavaliers men's basketball team this past year. Having been on the wrong side of the most egregious sports upset of all time, a number one seed losing to a 16-seeded team in the NCAA tournament. I imagine this past summer brought a whole lot of extra effort and work, that every practice was a little bit harder, every workout was a little more precise, and everyone felt obligated to put in those extra shots so that if the moment came again, they would be ready to capitalize. And it did. In the final four, down two points with one second to go, a player by the name of Kyle Guy found himself at the free throw line, 15 feet away from the hoop with three free throws left. A chance to go to the title game and perhaps flip the script of the narrative of their story. He tells a reporter after the game, well, I could lie to you and tell you that I was confident I was going to hit him all along, but, but I wasn't. In fact, I was terrified. He steps up to the line, sinks all three free throws. They go to the title game. They win the national championship, and they create arguably one of the best sports stories of all time. So what was it about in the midst of fear and being terrified that allowed Kyle to step up to the line and hit three free throws with the weight of the world watching him. I think he can reflect back to the thousands upon thousands of shots over and over and over again over the last few years, the last decades of his life, standing at that same free throw line, shooting shot after shot after shot. And finally, it paid off. You see, there are moments in our lives that allow us to make a definitive change, to leverage things on behalf for ourselves or others. The work that we put in, the dedication and devotion to maybe a particular person or institute, the influence of ourselves and others. And I believe this applies directly to our impact in the kingdom of God that you and I both alike have been called to make a difference in this world with our life by being ready to capitalize on moments and people and circumstances that God has put in front of us. So the question becomes, how can we be ready to capitalize on the moment when it comes with great boldness and expectation of what God might be setting us up to do? And such is the story of ours this morning. I want to welcome you into week two of our series entitled Fierce. And what we've been doing is uh, going through the stories of some of the most unique women throughout Scripture. We're going to cover four of them. Last week we looked at the story of Deborah. And Deborah is this woman whose name was Honeybee. And then she actually had a counterpart who's, who was JL, whose name means mountain goat. And so together the milk and honey, they restored Israel into the promised land, the land of milk and honey together. And today we're going to look at the story of a prophetess by the name of Holda. Everyone say Holda with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Holda. Has a great ring to it, don't you think? Uh, Holda's name actually means mole or weasel. And so if you're looking for a name to name like a recent child, I suggest you steer away from Holda. And, uh, but, you know, the mole or the weasel, and this is going to become important later, is an animal that digs and burrows for comfort and nourishment into the ground. And you're going to see why that's important through the life of Holda. But we've been unpacking this series big idea that we want to just put out there and kind of address every single week, and it's this. It's that while women, this is all throughout Scripture, have not always been prominent, they have always been what we're going to say is preeminent. And here's what we mean by that. That it's no, it's no secret that women are not overly prominent throughout the pages of Scripture. That as you thumb through the stories and, and you listen to the narratives, that the Bible appears to be very male dominant. However, we can glean and we can see that women have always been preeminent. They have been distinguished and utilized in various roles, some similar to men, others not. 
So I want to give a quick shout out to Jared Prince who's preaching over in Urbana this morning as he stumbled across this quote as we were studying for this morning's message. It's by Carolyn, uh, Carol Myers from her book, Re uh, Rediscovering Eve, and I think it gr gives us great context. She says this, she says that women are largely unseen in the Hebrew Bible. The women we glimpse in the Hebrew Bible are exceptional. They are women who rose to positions of prominence. And such is the story of Huldah this morning. And so if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. As you turn there, you might be thinking, you might be nudging someone next to you, who's this Huldah lady? Have you ever heard of Huldah? I never heard of Huldah. I never, you know, I barely know her, like type of deal, right? Like so, so where does the story of Huldah come from? And she's almost a footnote in a story of one of the other kings, King Josiah. In the book of 2 Kings, uh, we're about 650 years before the time of Jesus, and the nation of Israel is actually split into two kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah, and they are being ruled by these kings, and they're going through this cycle, some good kings, some bad kings, and then we start chapter 22, we get introduced to this young boy by the name of Josiah at the age of eight. Anybody have a kid around the age of eight years old around here? Okay. Now, I want you to imagine for a second that that child was then given the kings to an entire kingdom. <laughs> because that was Josiah. At the age of eight, the kingdom is his, the land, the authority, the influence, it's all it's his. And so I, I can only imagine that once my kid turns eight, that if he had to rule a country, he'd be like, all right, everyone's getting a cupcake every day and we're going to watch Paw Patrol till we get bored out of our minds, okay? But instead, so we get King Josiah. He's eight years old and he begins to reign as king. But he comes from a line of poor spiritual heritage. Both his father and his grandfather did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not Josiah. He decides to flip the script in one moment, in one decision. And the way he does this is he began to ask this question. You see, the temple of God, the, 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 the Biet Hamakdash as it's called, it's in ruins. It's being mishandled. It's not being utilized for the worship, the reverence that the people of God were called to. And so he makes this, I think, this statement, this question to himself. How can our spiritual lives be vibrant and healthy if our temple is in shambles? And so at the age of 26, just a few years into his reign, he begins to make a decision. It's time for us to restore and cleanse the temple back to the way that it's created to be. He taps this priest by the name of Hilkiah on the shoulder. And he says, Hilkiah, I'm going to give you all the money. I'm going to give you all the people, all the resources. And I want you to restore this temple back into the way that God has ordained it to be. And this is where we pick up our story this morning. 2 Kings chapter 22, starting in verse 8. Follow along with me. Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary... I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and the supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Achaim son of Shephiam, uh, Akbar son of Micaiah, and Shaphan the secretary, and Isaiah the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because of those who have gone before us, have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. So here's what's kind of happening is, is Josiah, he gives them the orders and the commands and they begin to rummage through the temple and they're kind of tearing it down to the foundation and they find this book and they don't know what it is. It's a bad sign if you find some of the Bible and you're the people of God and you don't know quite what it is. And so they got this book and they said, we don't know what it is. And so they, they go to the king and it says they read part of the book of the law. It's a reference to the Torah, the first five books of scripture, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. 
And King Josiah, he hears the words most likely from Deuteronomy. He says he rips his cloak out of grieving because of the anger of the Lord. He begins to connect the dots that what happened centuries before because of bad spiritual decisions on the leaders, uh uh-oh, we seem like we're heading in the same direction. This is not good news. Now, there's a great sidebar sermon here that we'll have to save for another time, but I love the connection of what's happening. You see, Josiah is saying we need to remodel, we need to completely redo and restore our faith. He didn't say let's just get some shiplap and kind of just throw some paint over all the walls of the temple and call it good. He's not looking for a little makeover type of deal. He's saying we need to completely redo this. Let's get it down to the foundation. And when they get the temple down to the foundation, they find the foundation of the personhood of God, the scripture, which then leads them to understand the foundation of their faith. But again, that's a sermon for another time. And so this man, he he, he comes and he he reads it to Josiah and he tears his robes and he's he's grieving, he's burdened. He comes to this realization that that my father and my grandfather were bad kings and they have led us astray from God. Their poor decisions now means one thing and one thing only is that the anger of the Lord is upon us and he comes to a conclusion. He looks at Hilkiah and his four friends and he says, guys, go find out what this means. Go find someone who can understand, who can interpret, and tell us what this means. What is the word of God trying to say to us? And this is what they do in verse 14. Hilkiah the priest, Hilkiah Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to speak to the prophet Holda, who was the wife of Shalom, son of Tikva, son of Haras, Keeper of the wardrobe. Of course, the lady's always around the clothes, but, you know, that's for another time. It says she lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. So Josiah, he has a decision to make. It's a critical moment. He says, okay, we have one moment to kind of figure this out. And so he gets all five of them together. He says, all right, guys, here's what I want you to do. You just need to go find some person. Go find one person to tell us what, what, what this means and then bring the news back to me. And so Hokiah rounds up the guys. He's like, all right, guys, uh, all right, who, well, what do you got? What are your thoughts? Who, who, who do you go see? And one guy, well, there's always Jeremiah. Oh, I don't want to go see Jeremiah. Uh, he's, he's just like, he's like, he's always crying because he's like the doomsday prophet. And, and, and he, he might be over in Assyria talking to the exiled Jews. I don't really know. Okay, um, well, 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 how about Zephaniah? Uh, Zephaniah, he's just so black and white and he's so short. And I just, I don't know, he uses a lot of big words. I'm not really sure if Zephaniah is the right guy. And then someone throws out, well, what about Holda? Yeah, Holda's here in town. She's in the new quarter, the second quarter. Yeah, maybe, let's, let's, let's go find Holda. This is where we get introduced to Holda. She was the husband of the wardrobe keeper, which means she was respected. She was probably a seamstress. She lived in the second district or the new quarter, as it says, which meant she was privileged, but she wasn't royalty. See, they could have gone to any prophet, yet they chose to go to Holda. See, there's a difference between going to a prophet and going to a priest in this time. You see, a priest was somebody who was specifically ordained because they came from the tribe of Levi. It was somebody who went on behalf of the people to make atonement uh, to God, saying, okay, these people have sinned. I will then go be the mediator between the people and God. But instead, they needed a prophet, which is kind of the opposite. See, a prophet was somebody who would go on behalf of God to speak to the people. They would know the word of God. They lived the word of God. They understood the word of God in a way that they could teach it to others. You see, the word prophet comes from the Hebrew word, which means to bubble forth as through a fountain. I love that concept. It's kind of this idea that that every prophet, they have this, 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 this living water inside of them, and it bubbles forth out of their mouth and out of their soul. They can't continue it because it's just there living and they 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 have to get it out for the sake of other people to find nourishment you see a prophet wasn't necessarily somebody who just told about the future they weren't fortune tellers in fact about 95 percent of what prophets did is they just taught and explained the word of god and so the same went for holda the respected prophetess of this time They find Hulda, and this is the answer that she gives. Get a kick out of this. 
So she said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Tell the man who sent you to me. Hold on. That's the king she's talking about. Just go tell that little wee little man this message that God has for him. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people. According to everything written in the, in the book, the king of Judah has read, because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all of the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and it will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says concerning these words that you have heard. So he's speaking directly to Josiah. Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have also heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors. You will be buried in place in peace. Your eyes will not see all of the disaster I am going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. Dun, dun, dun. Let me just ask you a question. If you had to deliver really bad, poor, unfortunate, damning news to the king of your country, would you be tempted to water it down? Would you be tempted to maybe just fudge it a little bit so it doesn't seem as harsh? Would you maybe keep out a couple parts so that, you know, maybe he still likes you later on? When the emotions and the fear start to swirl in the moment, would you be ready to practice what you've been preaching all your life? See, the story of Holda is a quick one. It's very linear and you can miss her. She's just but a blip in the radar. But I think there's three questions that we can ask that really prop up the prominence and the preeminence and a couple things that we can glean from this prominent and preeminent woman's life. Number one, the first question is simply this. What qualified Holda for the task? What qualified Holda in order to answer the king to determine whether or not this was in fact the word of God and give to them the answer that God would have willed? It's pretty simple. So she knew and lived the word of God. You see, the way in which someone became a prophet or a prophetess was not by going to vistaprint.com and getting up a bunch of uh, new business cards that says, Eric the prophet, and then you start handing them off out to people and say, hey, if you need a good prophecy, I'm your man, you know, hand it out to your friends and we'll see what they like. That's not how it was. You had to have been somebody who developed over time, that you had to receive training. You had to know and understand and dig into the word of God. There's this secondary resource in ancient, uh, the ancient Middle East called the Mishnah, which gives us kind of some other aspects of understanding that they believe that Huldah was so preeminent and so prominent as a prophetess that in the second quarter that she probably had a college in which she trained other women to be a prophetess. And so this is where Huldah's name really begins to take meaning and shape. So here is this woman whose name means Mole or weasel, the animal that digs for comfort and nourishment. And so we have this woman who dug consistently, regularly, over and over and over again into the word of God to find comfort and peace and nourishment, then to pass it out to others. She was qualified because she knew and lived the word of God. She was familiar enough with the scriptures to be able to say, yes, what you have brought to me, that is the Torah. So I think one of the things we can glean from the life of Hulda is that your devotion will determine the difference you will make. Hulda was specifically devoted to her faith in God. To understanding the word, the prayers, the people. She lived it in a way in which no one could say anything otherwise. All of us are devoted to something in this life. All of us dedicate our time, our energy into efforts to many different things, and so my question is, where is your devotion? What are you devoted to at this stage, this moment, this time of your life? And will you be ready to capitalize on that for the kingdom of God if the moment presents itself? 
The second question is, why did they choose Huldah over the other prophets? Why was Huldah chosen over the other prophets? Some scholars like to give out this facet, and they say, well, it's probably because Jeremiah was over in Assyria trying to bring encouragement to the exiled Jews, so he wasn't around. Zephaniah was just kind of bonkers, and so Huldah was kind of the only option. But the thing is, if this was something so specific, so critical, that the king said, I need to know, we have to get this right, it wouldn't have been without reason for them to say, okay, well, we're going to go find Jeremiah. We're going to wait until Zephaniah comes back before we give you an answer. But that's not what they did. So why Huldah? It's because she was ready to proclaim the word of God. She was ready. She was able. She was available to them. Now, perhaps they thought, well, maybe, maybe if we go to a prophetess, if we go to a woman, she'll maybe, you know, she'll just be a little nicer. <laughs> maybe, maybe a little more compassionate. Maybe, maybe not hurt our feelings as bad. You know, Jeremiah, he's always a doomsdayer, so we definitely don't want to go see him in this time. See, I don't think that's the reason at all. I think it's specifically because she was seen as capable. She was seen and respected in a way within her peers and the influence of prophets that she could handle this, no questions asked. The third question then is how did she respond? She had the task of providing some pretty gruesome news with a little bit of grace sprinkled in. Josiah, since you have grieved and humbled yourself, God will show you grace. How did she respond? Hulda had the courage and boldness to tell the king the plan of God. Simply that, as it was, she didn't add, she didn't subtract. She pulled no punches. She was true to her calling. This is what the Lord declares, that she was compassionate when needed, but she delivered the message as God intended it to. So I think the second thing we gleaned from Hulda this morning is that a moment of boldness can spur a movement of faithfulness, but it first requires a life of devotion. Hulda lived six, seven, eight hundred years possibly before the time of the New Testament, before the Apostle Paul penned the letter to the Galatians in which he said this, but I think she would resonate deeply. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul said, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. In one singular moment, because Hulda was ready, she was able to say, I am a servant of God and God alone. And that moment changed the entire course of history of our faith. So what about you? Where does your devotion and dedication lie? What about the moments that maybe God has placed in front of you, the people, the circumstances, the opportunity? Will you be ready and prepared to leverage those situations for a way that glorifies God, or are you just going to go fingers crossed, hoping you'll make the right choice when that time comes? I want you to think about something for me. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but maybe you've made a decision to, to do something. I'm going to go talk to that person. I'm going to go march into my boss's office. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go home tonight. I'm going to make a plan. And then you get to it, and then all of a sudden you get cold feet, and you kind of back out. Somebody opens their mouth, and, and you kind of, you know, you, you back off. You don't really have the chutzpah, the courage that you thought you were going to in the moment. You ever been there? You see, oftentimes we, we approach those moments and we say, okay, I know what I want to do and how I want to respond. Or maybe you reflect back onto those moments and you say, if I could go back in time, if I could do it all over again, go have that conversation, go, go into that moment to have that choice again, I would do it differently. And so the question isn't, what are you going to do in the moment? The question is, how are you going to prepare now to capitalize when the moment comes? Because you're faced with moments all the time. Every single day, every single week, you have a choice to capitalize on moments to, to further the kingdom of God. Personally, your own time, your own faith, your own journey with Jesus. If you're married, 
How are you pursuing your spouse in a way that Jesus loves them the same way that you ought to love them? If you have kids, how are you setting up the priorities and the standards of your life? What are you communicating and making those choices and those decisions? Are you somebody who wants to always act with integrity so that when the time comes, people can say, no, 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 not him, not her. They, they, they always do the right thing. In your singleness, are you pursuing relationships that are honoring to God? Because when it gets down to it, you have to count the cost and consider the weight. Hold up. She had every opportunity. I'm not quite sure I want to go down this road. I'm not quite sure this is going to be tough. This isn't going to be easy. Maybe I just water it down. Maybe I just can dull the blow, but she did not. We all want to be ready for when the moment comes, but the truth is you have to be ready for when that moment comes. We can't live detached from the root and expect to bear fruit. Here's what I mean by that. In John chapter 15, verse 5, Jesus gave us these words. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. That anyone who abides in me, I will abide in them. I don't think anyone steps into faith. I don't think anyone steps into a relationship with Jesus hoping for it to be as low as possible, as, as mediocre as possible. I think a lot of us have really good intentions, don't we? We have, we have a lot of good thoughts and ideas of, of how we want our faith to be fleshed out. The question isn't then what are your intentions or what are you doing when the moment comes. The question is how are you preparing yourself? Are you ready to stand strong and firm when the opportunity comes? If you want to be ready, you have to prepare to be ready. That your dedication to your devotion will dictate the difference that you will make. We can't just cross our fingers and hope that when the time comes, we'll make the right choice. When the emotions are flying, when the fear sets in, the influence of, of the world are kind of creeping in, you have to prepare now. You have to choose now, be devoted now, dedicated now, day in and day out, so when those moments come, you know you will be ready. Let's move to a time of response. Some of uh, scholars believe that if it wasn't for Holda's ability to discern that the book of the law brought, brought to, to her, that, that Josiah and them found, that they think that there's a small chance that the Torah would not have continued. Now, I believe that God is sovereign, that he knew this was going to happen, but it speaks to the fact of her readiness and her ability, her devotion to God. And so this morning for you, what do your commitments and your priorities say about your faith? I want to ask you a string of questions. They might press in a little bit. They might get a little tender. But I think it's appropriate after reflecting on the life of Hulda, we have to all look inside and say, how is it that I am living this life that Jesus has called me to live? Do you respect your faith and give it its due the way you ought to? Are you pursuing holiness and chasing after Jesus? Are you seeking wisdom? Do you find yourself growing spiritually? Do you have time in prayer? Do you have times of courage and boldness for the sake of God? Are you able to discern the truths of God? Do you find yourself filled with the word of God on a regular basis? But most importantly, do you make yourself available for the Lord to use you as he sees fit? Are you willing to do what God has called you to do within the bounds of his spirit and his church? Do you feel spiritually qualified to do that? And if not, why is that? It's all throughout history, Old Testament, New Testament, church history, up until this point, even for us today, the people who start movements, the people who do radical things for God aren't any different than you and I. The only thing that might be different is how they prepare every day to be ready for the moments when they come. 
But they don't hope and say, well, okay, if, if the opportunity comes my way, then, then I have an idea of how I want to respond. Instead, it's, it's this is the word, this is my prayer, this is who I am, this is who Jesus is calling me to do. So when they're faced with that decision with their kids, with their spouse, with their job, with where they will live, what they're going to do, who they're going to interact with, the relationships, everything that life throws at us, all of the moments, all of the circumstances, they live in such a way that they can say, I know exactly how I will respond because I believe in the spirit of Jesus living in me. My, my heart and my prayer for this church is, is twofold from this story. Is Number one is that, 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 that we as your pastors and your elders, that we will lead in a way like King Josiah, that when there has been faults, when there has been mistakes, that we grieve, that we tear our robes and we pursue the throne of God with great humility and experience the grace of Jesus. My greater prayer and hope for all of us. So we capitalize on the moments because you are faced with moments right here and now. You will, you, you will step into the office Tuesday morning and you have a chance and opportunity to talk to that person, that someone will open their door and say, hey, 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 well, well, tell me about this faith that you claim to be in. I mean, you're going to get ready to go to college and you step onto a campus in which all of the thoughts about spirituality are all going to be just scattered like paint on a wall and you will have a decision, an opportunity to stand firm in the truth of Jesus Christ. On Friday, some of you, you're going to drive home, you're going to step into your house and it's going to be absolute chaos. You're going to have a choice of how you speak to your wife and to your kids. You're going to have a decision when somebody sends you a text. Hey, what are you doing tonight? You want to come out. I want us to be the church that whenever we have the moment and the opportunity to be ready, that we capitalize because we believe in the grace of Jesus, that, that there was one man who was absolutely ready, that he did not deter from the kingdom of God and the mission of God, that when God says, I want to make a way to redeem everyone back into a relationship with me, I will send my son Jesus, and he will go to the point of death on a cross, he will, he will be sweating blood in the garden. He will say, let this cup pass, but not my will, Lord, but your will be done. So that anyone who believes through faith has new life. And I want us to live with that spirit, with that tenacity, with that boldness, with the courage of hold of the, the dedication, the devotion, so that when we get into these times and these moments that we are a church that says this is our moment, this is our time, when we make a difference because our God is with us. The question is, how are you going to be ready to be ready? You came into this church this morning to worship. In some ways, the act of coming here was an act of worship because you set a priority in your mind, in your schedule, to get into a car and to get here. You worshiped when you came in and you said hi to your fellow brothers and sisters of this local body. You acted in worship as you sung out the words of these songs. Maybe you just let them kind of swirl around in your mind as you thought about them. You acted in worship as we read together the word of God and understood what it's trying to say to us. And we invite you to continue to worship with us this morning as we partake in communion together. Uh, there are these stations across the room, these little tables with these fake candles on them. At these stations, there's a little cracker and a little juice. So on the night that Jesus was arrested, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it in half and he said, this is my body, take and eat. And he held up the cup. He said, this is my blood shed for you, take and drink. And he looked at his disciples and he said, do this in remembrance of me. Remembering that Jesus was the one who was ready, who stepped up in the moment to bring us new life, that he is the only way, truth, and the life that continues to walk with us every day. So as the band continues to lead us in worship over these next two songs, we invite you to remember the readiness of Jesus. That you can just get up and approach one of these tables whether you're a member, a regular attender, just visiting, checking things out, but you have said yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do that during this time. 
Some of you came to continue in your worship through your tithes and offerings. You, if you want to visit one of our given respond boxes during this response time or after service, we would love for you to do that as well too. Lastly, there are these benches here at the front of the stage. This is what we like to call the altar. Maybe you want to take a step out of those rows and you come forward in boldness and in courage and expectation as the author of Hebrews tell us that we have the boldness to approach the throne of God because of the blood of Jesus. So if you want to take time to do that this morning during these next couple songs as well, we invite you to do that. Pray whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, whatever you brought in here with you, whatever you want to take with you out, we invite you to do that as well. And may we be the church, may we be the people of God, that we are dedicated to our devotion so that we can be ready when we need to be. Would you stand with me as we continue to worship this morning?